Maraban. Welcome. I'm Dr. Elise Marquis, and I'm very, very glad to see a very large number tonight coming to our sixth science talk at the YAS Seaworld Research and Rescue Center. Uh, so first of all, many thanks for coming. And again, as you know, I wanted to thank uh, all our collaborators because this um, event or this series is done in partnership with the Environmental, Environmental Agency Abu Dhabi, Emirates Natural History Group Abu Dhabi, the Natural History Museum Abu Dhabi, and Nautica Environmental Associates. So my thanks to them, and I see many of them around here again tonight. Um, tonight, it's a bit special because we will be looking at the past history of the region. And when I say history, I mean geological time scale. We will be looking at traces and clues of ancient environments way before any scrap buildings appeared in the Emirates. And for me, there is always a strong mystical feeling when looking at the natural scenery here across the Arabian Peninsula. I was not sure where it was coming from until my husband yesterday mentioned that because of the absence of humus vegetation, actually, uh, history is here, just visible before our eyes, with the layers of the sedimentary rocks, with the ripple marks on the sandstone, with the flush cap rock underwater, or just a grain of sand in the dunes. Plus, we can easily see what the weather and the climate does to the, do to the, to, to the environment. You just have to walk across a wadi just after the, uh, the storm last week, and you can see how the water is actually shaping right now, right there, the environment as we see. Um, seeing the past and feeling the present, I think it's pretty mystical as, a, as a, a, an experience, and the Arabian Peninsula definitely gives us that. Anyway, and enough of me talking, but I'm very, very, very glad to have tonight two um, experts in the field of paleontology and earth science coming to the center. We have Dr. Thomas Stuber and Dr. Mark Beach here tonight. They will be talking about um, all the knowledge that they acquired during the long years that they've been here in the region. They will be talking about sea level changes and uh, they will be talking about all the paleontology uh, wonders that you can find in the region. Um, just a reminder, keep your questions for the end. We will have the Q&A question session at the end of the two talks. Um, and I will welcome Dr. Thomas Stuber to start uh, the evening. Dr. Stuber, and I'm sorry, I don't pronounce it well. Stuber, you will tell us. Okay, he's professor of earth sciences at Khalifa University. He has published more than 80 papers and more than 190 conference abstracts and proceedings. Um, his research interest, and I'm sure you will uh, discover in a minute what I'm talking about, it's about sedimentology and paleontology of the Cretaceous carbonate platforms. He is using as well geochemistry to, um, to fill up or to, to um, elaborate the earth system sciences. Anyway, um, I will let him talk about his work and about the sea level ch changes in the uh, environment here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elise, for the introduction and, of course, for um, inviting me for this presentation. So, um, I typically work on, um, on rocks which are at least uh, 60 million years old. So, I typically work in uh, deep geological time, looking at aspects uh, of Earth's system which are um, quite hidden in the end. And it occurred during COVID, when traveling was not easily possible, that I took a closer look at the rocks around the place where I live. Admittedly, uh, you would say there is not much. There are a few hills, a few depressions, 
a swamp and a wetland. But as an earth scientist, you're always interested in finding out why are they there? Why is there a hill there? Why is there a depression there? How did they form? And um, <clears throat> what is it in the end? So the talk today will be um, about the youngest rocks in Abu Dhabi. So the sea level and climate change in the Arabian Gulf during the last ice ages. So basically I'm talking about the last 200,000 years, which may sound a lot for most of you, but for a geologist, it's um, yeah, um, very difficult uh, to, uh, to figure out. The history is basically still in very much unfolding history, but I thought the title was already long enough. Um, because when looking into the details, I realized that there are actually a lot of unknowns, um, despite the fact that the rocks are so young. So globally, uh, late quaternary sea level changes are, are quite well known. And um, if you look here, for the last 350,000 years, there were sea level changes of quite significant amplitude, uh, about 120 meters. And you see the um, low points of this curve at minus 120 meters, referring to the modern sea level. This have, uh, these have been the peaks of the um, ice ages, and they were each time followed by a rapid uh, sea level rise. How did this come about? 120 meters of sea level change in a short period of time. Uh, that's quite extraordinary. And it was the result of the waxing and waning of uh, the polar ice shields. If we have a look at Europe during the peak of the last ice age, we see over Scandinavia um, an ice shield with uh, two and a half kilometers of thickness. Over the northern part of the UK, that you may be able to identify here uh, on the left-hand side of the diagram, the ice shield was about a kilometer thick. So all this water, well, and you can imagine similar things in Antarctica, in North America, uh, Siberia, and all this ice was, of course, water that was missing in the ocean. So during these times, the sea level was about 120 meters lower. You can also see this uh, if you look at the shorelines. You see that UK is connected uh, to the European mainland. And <coughs> when this ice melted, obviously uh, the sea level rose. So during a time when the sea level was 120 meters lower than today, this means that the Arabian Gulf was dry. It's a very shallow sea. Uh, and it doesn't actually reach 120 meters, only in a few very isolated areas close to the Iranian coast. So during the last ice age, um, the Arabian Gulf was dry, so a very different environment. Then the ice uh, started melting, and within 18,000 years, the sea level rose by about 120 meters. The Arabian Gulf was flooded, and it actually overshoot, if you can see uh, in the red circle. For a short period of time, the sea level was actually about two meters higher uh, than today. This was about uh, six, five to 6,000 years ago, and uh, that's a well-known phenomenon uh, from all over the world. But it's also, um, you can see the traces of that in Abu Dhabi. One example on the right hand side, you see the Musafa Road, and um, in this location, a couple of years ago, the skeleton of a whale, I think it was a humpback whale, uh, was found and um, excavated. And I think, Mark, you may also have been involved um, in this. <coughs> we actually found it during a field trip um, of uh, our university, and it was later then um, uh, professionally studied and also age-dated. And in fact, it um, is about five to 6,000 years old, so it comes from this time when the sea level was higher. 
Otherwise, obviously, so the coastline must have been even further inland, otherwise it would be quite diffi difficult to get a whale skeleton that far inland. Other evidence you can find on the left lower side. So uh, you see these lineations running across uh, the image. These are former beaches. So five to six thousand years ago, the coast may, may have been somewhere like here. And then the coastline slowly retreated and left behind these um, beaches perfectly parallel aligned to each other. So far, <coughs> that's a quite consistent story and um, not a lot of surprises. So we actually see quite obvious evidence for this sea level high stand two meters above the current level about five to six thousand years ago. Well, we also find fossils. <coughs> uh, this is a quite unusual so-called giant clam if you look at the scale, so it's truly giant. It has been dredged from sediments 12 meters below the modern seafloor. So normally it's too deep because uh, these uh, Gaian clams live um, on tropical reef flats in water depths not typically larger than five meter. It's older than 50,000 years because we tried radiocarbon age dating and it simply doesn't contain any radiocarbon anymore, so it must be older than um, 50,000 years. There is a independent, quite interesting story about this species. It has only been described about 10 years ago and it was very abundant in the Red Sea about 120,000 years ago, which would match with uh, the age of our specimen. It's still living there today, but only in very small numbers. And there are theories that um, the reduction of the species 120,000 years ago may have been <coughs> the result of um, Stone Age humans feeding on them because they provide food which is easily accessible. Here you can see modern representatives, uh, how they are exposed on a reef flat at very low tide. And it's a quite unique bivalve because it's not lying flat on the sediment or within the sediment, it's exposed like this. So it exposes its mantle to the sunlight it has photosymbionts, similar to uh, corals. So it has a quite unique lifestyle. <coughs> but of course, they are very uh, easy to harvest. So um, if you're looking for a seafood meal for the larger family, one of them will be more than enough. These thick skeletons um, offer an excellent opportunity to get some information about the water masses in which they lived. You can apply uh, isotope analysis. There are nowadays quite sophisticated so-called dual clumped isotope analysis, which give you information not just about the water temperature, but also about the uh, salinity of water at that uh, time. So one objectives of um, our current research is to do age dating, which is not easy uh, during this uh, time window, and apply methods that allow us to say what was the temperature and salinity of the Arabian Gulf during the lifespan of these bivalves. You can see the growth lines, which represent individual years, and uh, the preliminary temporary history derived from these shells can be seen in the uh, inset. Okay, so <coughs> we suddenly have the problem Okay, are uh, some of these features that we see, are they from the very well-known sea level high stand uh, five to 6,000 years ago, or may they be older? And you find, for example, on the offshore islands of Abu Dhabi, deposits that are marine on top of continental deposits. And, sorry, the current understanding is um, that 
this transgression, this sea level flooding, um, occurred at about 120,000 years ago. But they are sitting um, two meters above modern sea level, so they could likewise be from the last uh, sea level high stand. So are they five to 6,000 years old or possibly 120,000 years old? Well, now let's have a brief look what happened in continental areas, because most of the marine environment, which is now below sea level, is not easily um, accessible. And when the sea level was 120 meters lower, or just 50 meters lower, uh, it's difficult to get information from marine archives from that time. Well, what happened on land? <coughs> on land, um, Aeolian dune-type deposits accumulated because at that time we had a sediment source that we do not have today. If you consider all the exposed former sleep floor of the Arabian Gulf, this was the source for sand that was blown inland. Nowadays there is water, so there is very limited sediment being blown in from the Arabian Gulf. But during that time at the lower sea level, the situation was different. Here you see the arrows which uh, indicate the direction of the uh, Shamal winds and uh, the yellow lines show the uh, coastlines at um, 15,000 or 11,000 years ago. So the Shamal winds traveled over continental areas where they could pick up uh, sand and uh, accumulate them further inland. And these deposits are the uh, fossil dunes of the so-called Gaiati Formation. They are now in certain areas preserved and form quite spectacular outcrops, but they actually form the subsurface over large areas of Abu Dhabi. And in fact, the uh, existence of Abu Dhabi Island, of uh, Sadia and Yas Island, is largely owed uh, to the presence of these quite strong uh, sedimentary rocks. They are real rocks, as you can see. You can use a hammer to um, get samples. And why that is, is that they are quite strongly cemented. They have a relatively large amount of um, carbonate grains. And uh, you can see in the right-hand side, so this is a thin section photograph. The blue color is pore space. You can see different types of grains. And you can see that uh, these grains are quite strongly uh, cemented. If you think about a dune, a dune is a transient feature. They travel. Some of you, those of you who go to the desert occasionally, uh, you are well aware that when you come back to a site you visited a year ago, it looks completely different because the dunes are moving. So they are not typically uh, preserved in the geological record unless they are demobilized. And this can only happen when the sea level rises. When the sea level rises, the sand cannot longer move anymore and uh, the dunes are preserved. A right, not the sea level, the groundwater level. The rising groundwater level, of course, also causes cementation of the dunes. So uh, if you look at the fossil dunes of the Gaiathi Formation, it's not just an ancient dune system, it's a dune system which was fixed, held in place by a rising groundwater table, which also caused cementation and turned the fossil dunes into a rock. So each time you see such a fossil dune, um, uh, keep in mind that you are basically now on a former, on the surface of a former dune, but also uh, in a place that was originally below the groundwater table. So you see there have been quite significant climate change. There was quite significant climate change during these times, uh, also in continental areas. Well, here you see other features of the cementation. You see a quartz grain uh, covered by these carbonate uh, cement crusts. So this is one type of deposits that we find from this time. <coughs> Carbonate sand being blown out from the bottom of um, the Arabian Gulf. 
piled up in dunes, which were subsequently held in place and cemented by a rising groundwater table. From this time, there are also other deposits, the so-called Madinat Zayed Formation, which is also a semi-consolidated former dune, but it has a completely different composition. It's uh, composed mostly of quartz grains, while the Gayathi Formation mostly consists of carbonates. So they are not as strongly cemented. In the middle on the left, you have um, a person for scale. And these outcrops show the typical features of dune systems, spin stripe lamination, large scale cross bedding. But they obviously must formed must have formed during completely different in completely different environmental uh, conditions because they have a very different uh, composition. Another unit from that time is uh, the so-called Healy formation, um, which are basically wadi deposits. On the inset on the left, in uh, purple, you can see their distribution. And you can see that you can actually trace them um, to Abu Dhabi. So uh, I'm familiar with an outcrop in the al Wahba wetland reserve. And they are basically semi-consolidated gravels, deposits of wadis. So apparently there was a time during the late Quaternary <coughs> when there was sufficient rainfall that uh, the wadis, which are now just flowing a few kilometers into the desert from the Hajar Mountains around Al Ain, where there was enough water that um, the wadis was flowing from the area of Al Ain straight to uh, Abu Dhabi. This may have been the same time when the groundwater level was high enough to uh, cement uh, the fossil dunes. In a cross section, we get this fairly um, let's say, complex image of the alluvial fence and wadi deposits of the Hilly Formation, which can be traced just right to um, Abu Dhabi. They are considered to be time equivalent with uh, the uh, fossil dunes of the Madinat Zayed Formation and the carbonate cemented paleodunes of the Gayathi Formation are supposed to be sitting on top of them. And on top of this, in yellow, we have the modern active uh, dune system. Now, a problem with all this is that it's next to impossible to age date uh, these deposits uh, reliably. It would cause, <coughs> or it would take another lecture to explain the methods that can be used and uh, what are the problems associated with uh, these age dating methods. But this is the untold part of the story, because obviously a story needs a storyline, story line, so you need to put things in the correct sequence of um, events. And this is what we are currently working on. Coming back, um, we are trying to age date these transgressive surfaces. So here, this one, two meters above the modern sea level, possibly the results of the sea level high stand just five to 6,000 years ago. On the same, um, well, very close, you can see the typical image of the fossil dunes of the Gayathi Formation we are already now familiar with. And you see an erosive contact. You see a rugged line there, which uh, separates marine beach type deposits from the fossil dunes below. So that's an ancient uh, uh, transgression. And we collected quite a lot of data uh, simply uh, very precisely um, measuring their elevation. Because when they relate to a single event, then they should have the same elevation over relatively large areas. In some areas, you find similar surfaces six meters above the modern sea level. So you can see this here in the upper part of the image. You see the cross bedding and lamination of the fossil dunes in the lower part of the cliff. And then you see something different on top. And uh, in detail, you can see pebbles of the Gayathi formation, these laminated uh, fossil dune deposits pebbles at the base 
of high energy deposits that again mark a transgressive event. But this time, they are six meters above the modern sea level. So possibly from 120,000 years ago, how do these large clams, which are older than 50,000 years, fit into the picture, which lived at or five meters below the modern sea level? So plenty of open questions. And this is the summary. So the quaternary sedimentary deposits are archives of climate and sea level change that have shaped the modern geomorphology of Abu Dhabi. They derive from aeolian, so wind-driven, fluvial by rivers or wadis, and marine uh, erosion and transport processes. But a consistent chronology of these different types of deposits is still missing. So environmental reconstructions of the most recent sea level high stand, about two, two to three meters above the current sea level, uh, they will be very useful to analyze <coughs> predicted environmental change over the next 150 years. I've just seen, I've still a few minutes left, and you may wonder, I talked about the past, but everybody talks about sea level change in uh, uh, the future. So um, how is this related? You may have seen images like this, what Abu Dhabi would look like when the sea level would be one meter uh, higher. It's not a nice image um, because SeaWorld would have to move somewhere else. And uh, the Al-Raha area and Khalifa city would be consistently underwater. People living on Abu Dhabi Island uh, have taken a better choice. And also our whale, if you look at this image, it will be a lot easier for this whale to be beached here where uh, the whale from five to 6,000 years ago was actually found. Now, how realistic is this? Uh, the most recent predictions about sea level change, and uh, that's a fairly crowded diagram, but it shows what the International Panel on Climate Change uh, now considers to be reasonable for the not so near future. What we've seen on the image is a sea level one, man, one meter higher than uh, today. According to this diagram, this may happen in the year 2100 if the current CO2 emissions and global warming will continue um, more or less with uh, uh, business as usual. If we are um, able to manage to reduce CO2 emissions, then uh, sea, level range, uh, sea level rise will be much lower. There may be low likelihood high impact storylines, for example, if uh, large parts of the Antarctic uh, inland glaciers collapse and um, increase uh, the sea level, which will then cause a sea level rise by one meter uh, in a much shorter time period of, period of time. But these are the uh, predictions, uh, the predictions for the year 2150. Each of them staggered um, according to how successful emission reduction in terms of CO2 will be. And uh, then here for the year 2300, when the sea level may be up to seven meters higher. So again, time becomes very important. Many of you will think, who cares what will happen in the year 2100? But if you are to plan um, expensive infrastructure, then you may give it um, a second thought. So sea level is rising, it will continue to rise. Uh, but this diagram shows that there is not necessarily a reason to panic. It's to a certain extent um, a natural process. And you remember the sea level rise when the last polar ice cap melted. This sea level rise was actually faster than the sea level rise that we are currently um, experiencing. Okay, that's it. Amazing. 
Um, obviously, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so keep them in mind, and we'll ask uh, Thomas all the questions uh, we want just after. But first, let me introduce Dr. Mark Beach. Um, this is a real honor to have uh, Mark here tonight. Mark is um, the curator and the scientific lead of the Natural History Museum Abu Dhabi, and is also the head of maritime and paleontology unit in the Historic Environment Department at the Department of Culture and Tourism, DCT. Dr. Beach has worked in the United Arab Emirates for the past 29 years and has led expedition leading to the discovery of many Neolithic period settlements, such as the one in Gaga, Delma, and Marawa Islands. Um, he will, yes, come over. It's time, perfect, no problem. All right, come on, just Dr. Marbich. Your turn. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, thank you, SeaWorld, and thank you all the sponsors for our talk um, tonight. It's great, great to be here. I'm going to tell you, we're at SeaWorld, and I'm going to tell you about some of the ancient seas and things, but also a bit generally, um, because as I'm working for the Natural History Museum, some of you may have seen this as you come over the bridge to Sadiat Island from Abu Dhabi Island. You see a black building on your left-hand side. That's Team Lab Phenomena, the white building here to the right. This is the Natural History Museum. There's the Abrahamic Family House, and then there's the New Zayed National Museum there. As you come into the museum, and you can actually see this picture on the hoardings just out outside the museum as you drive along the road to Louvre Abu Dhabi, so I'm allowed to show this. <laughs> picture as you as you come in the natural history museum this is the atrium so when you come in so tonight it's a lecture about fossils it's about ancient seas of Abu Dhabi but also gives you a little taste of the future and the end of next year when you'll be able to visit the museum and this is the visitor journey in the museum so you're going to have a, a sample of the galleries in the natural history museum we start off with act zero that tells the story of the formation of the universe and the planet act one is evolution act two is the modern world act three is how we can be better custodians of the future now i have two jobs at the moment so i'm very tired <laughs> <laughs> I work for the Natural History Museum, but I also work for the Historic Environment Department, and we have to deal with all the development going on in Abu Dhabi, and this is a list of some of the jobs that we do. You don't have to read all this, but it's basically with the government department mandated to care for heritage, and some of the people in the audience here um, I interact with because they're building things on Jabail Island, in Fahed Island, so some of the... Uh, developers. Now, I thought it was interesting tonight to talk about how do we find fossils. Now, when we set off on a fossil expedition, I pack my rucksack and car with all the equipment, and uh, this is some of the key equipment that we take. Now, can anyone say, I actually take nearly everything on this on this slide, but there's one thing on this slide that doesn't actually help us finding fossils. Have you any, any of you an idea which, which one piece of equipment? That's an air compressor for, for pumping up the tires on your car, just in case you... So which, which one? Chips, Chips Oman. Chips Oman are essential. You know, if you're Emirati, you grow up with Chips Oman sandwich. No, actually, which one? Yeah, what, what, what about this? Do you, does anyone know what this thing, the yellow thing that looks a bit like a lawnmower? Seismic, yeah, yeah. Now, it is useful in geology, but it actually the se seismic is the... Is, is the right answer. We use seismic survey, GPR survey, for finding archaeology sites. It helps find cavities. When you're doing construction, you check 
if there are any cavities and things. It doesn't r actually, using seismic survey, it may help you to understand the geology layers deep down, things that like Thomas is interested in, but it doesn't actually, you can't, there, there isn't a magic machine for detecting fossils. So the most important thing to use is your eyes, your brain, your legs, <laughs> Your car gets stuck in the desert. You have your geology maps, your notebooks. You use your GPS. Always have a first aid kit in the car. Your geology hammer, shovel, especially when your car gets stuck, also to help digging. Essential food, chips Oman. Who said not to just chips Oman? Mahmoul, dates, Arabic coffee. We work out in the Western region, so we encounter a lot of the traditional, you know, Bedouin people in these areas. Plastic bags, marker pens, always have enough water, sunscreen, head cover, uh, computers, drones, cameras, phones, all modern equipment essential that we use. So you see nearly everything on this slide we use. And of course, we start off using satellite images, we can use geology maps. This is geology map of, of Alain. Um, now, why do I find fossils? Um, we have something in Abu Dhabi called the NOC system, No Objection Certificate System. This is run by the municipality, and I have to go and check if someone says, we're building houses everywhere in Fahed Island, like this gentleman over here, or Jabail. I go there and check that they're not destroying any heritage. So we go out there, and this is an online system, and we have to give permission for the developer to go ahead. So we go out, and we find fossils. And some of the audience are here. This is, this is Ronald, who's in the audience, wave, and, and uh, Relitza, his daughter. And his daughter found some nice fossils, and one of the fossils... Uh, she found is, is, is here. Actually, Ronald posted, the wonders of the internet, Ronald posted this picture of a shark tooth saying, I was hiking on Jebel Hafid, and, uh, and I thought, that's interesting. No one had found a shark tooth before. We have other fossils from there. So I contacted him, and we, uh, we went out on an expedition with Hamed here, who's one of our Natural History Museum curators. And we went out there and found more fossils. And so you can see, we're using GPS, we're using our camera, we have our water with us, all our equipment, sun hats, you see, Ralitza here. And uh, yeah, so she's holding this. And we, w we walked up the wadi and found some important fossils. I'll come back to those in a minute. The best way to get fossils, of course, is to dig them. And for dinosaur bones, we have to go to North America where you can legally acquire dinosaur fossils if they're from private land. Are there any dinosaur fossils found in UAE? Does anyone know? Yes, where? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you, you have to go to Dubai Mall to see Dubai Dino, I think, or the park in Dubai that has the Japanese animatronic dinosaurs. Dinosaur bones have been found in Oman and in Saudi Arabia. Recently in Egypt, they found a very interesting dinosaur, but we don't find dinosaurs here. Now, why that is, we'll come to in a minute. This is one of our Natural History Museum team, actually, um, um, Phil Manning. Um, what do we do when we discover a fossil site? We document it. In Abu Dhabi, we have a special system called the Abu Dhabi Historic Environment Record. This looks a bit like Google Earth. It's not open to public yet, but in about a year, year and a half's time, there'll be a public version of this. So we map the locations of all these fossil sites to protect them. Um, and then collaboration with our developers. This is in this case, it's ADNOC, it's the oil. Um, area near to Ruiz, we protect many of the sites, but we document them. Um, where can we also get fossils? You can go into a fossil shop and just buy buy some. Um, one of the problems with fossils, and they, you can buy online many fossils, it's only legal to get fossils from certain countries and certain places. It's illegal to export fossils from China, Mongolia, Argentina, 
many countries have rules and regulations. And in Abu Dhabi, because um, I, I have two hats when I wear my <laughs> DCT historic environment hat, I'm the in charge of the paleontology in Abu Dhabi. So we register all the fossils in our collection for the national collection and then the database that's shared to manage the sites. You can buy pretty fossils. They're not always legal. This is one of the issues. And also, if you're trying to get dinosaur fossils, you have to deal with um, basically commercial cowboy paleontologists. This is actually one of the famous ones, Clayton Phipps, if you've seen Discovery Channel. He discovered the dueling dinosaurs, which is actually an exhibition opening very soon. Um, but there's a whole lot of legal problems often with these uh, uh, dinosaurs. And then, of course, you can go to Christie's, Sotheby's, auction houses. But when you run a museum, you have to follow all the rules and regulations, do legal checks. Everything has to be above board. And there's, I'm sad to say, you know, there's a lot of things not done um, correctly. But being in a museum, you have to. Okay, so we're at SeaWorld. I'm going to take you on a journey now to ancient seas. So just to position you in time, we're talking about the Mesozoic era. And yes, as you know, dinosaurs occur. Dinosaurs start evolving in Permian-Triassic period, but actually they're mainly known in the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. Dinosaurs eventually go extinct. So there's been many environmental changes through this time. Now, there, there have been some studies done. This was a team from the Natural History Museum London, and they worked actually in the UAE and Oman, and this is Alain on this map. And there are, there's Jebel Hawea that's actually in Alain and also on the Baremi side. Some of you may have heard of Jebel Bohais, Jebel Faya, uh, Jebel Rauda, those are all in Sharjah Emirate. Um, and these are very rich in fossils from the late Cretaceous period. Now I've got, Hamed is going to help me here. Um, I have one of these late Cretaceous fossils, so it's quite nice we're at SeaWorld. And this is, this is about, um, probably about um, 80 million years old. So if you pass this around, don't drop it. Don't lick it, anything. You won't, you won't die, but it's, it's the oldest object probably that's ever been in SeaWorld so, so, so far. Um, I'm sure we'll find some older fossils in future. But um, anyway, this, these type of fossils are uh, known as um, rudists. Rudists is a primitive bivalve. Actually, Thomas is one of the uh, experts on this. He's more knowledgeable on this than me because this is rather old stuff um, for me. But they're basically a primitive bivalve. It's like, a, if you imagine, like the tube and then a lid. If you imagine like a saucepan with a lid on top, but it is a bivalve. These live in shallow, uh, warm seas and... There's a, um, they come in many different forms. So if you imagine we're here at SeaWorld, we press a magic button, we go back um, about 80 million years in time. What did it look like? Well, it looked like this. So this is SeaWorld, but uh, um, 80 million years ago. And uh, they almost look like cow horns, these things, but this is one of the types of, of rudists. And so you have shallow, quite warm seawater, you have some sort of primitive sharks, you could have um, uh, mosasaurs, we haven't found any fossils of them, but you find these basically sea creatures and you see these rudists form a kind of colony you see going off in the distance. Now, put your hand up, have you been to visit the Bohais Geology Park? Who's been? A very low percentage, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that's that's not even that's probably five percent of the room so you need to plan a weekend trip go to the Bohais geology park it's beautiful it's a visitor center it has a tr walking trail and it'll educate you about the fossils in these important outcrops the ones that the uh, natural history museum team originally studied and they have displays it's great for kids 
There's a really nice presentation film that talks about evolution of the mountains. Now, I'm going to come on to the next time period. Jebel Hafid actually has better outcrops. You remember the picture showing Ronald and, and Drelitsa here? That was just uh, in a wadi near Mubazara. Mubazara, put your hand up if you've been to Mubazara, where the hot springs. Okay, so there's more of you that have been there. You stuck your feet in the hot water in the springs and had some tea and Oman chips that they sell in the cafe there. Um, okay, so when you go up the wadi there, there's lots of uh, um, the uh, echinoids. Echinoids are sea urchins, and you have some oysters, and uh, you have a lot of numelite fossils as well. Numelites look like little stone coins. They're almost like M&Ms. Uh, like the chocolate buttons of different sizes, and these are all the sort of sea creatures. So we're talking now at about 40 to 50 million years ago. So when we were there, and do you remember the picture with, with Ralitza holding up? I think she was holding a stick. She was saying it looks like an ice cream, like, a, uh, like the whirly ice cream. This is the bottom part of a very large gastropod. If I can pass this around. So, okay, so you've gone from 80 million now to 40, 50 million. We don't have exact dates. It's like, uh, like Thomas said, there's still more work to be done on uh, precise dating. Uh, these are these numelites. Numelites, it's like from the word numulus, um, meaning coin. You heard the numismatics, people who study coins. Uh, numelites are fossils, and you find these actually in Egypt as well. Ancient Egyptians used to use them as kind of tokens and stuff. Maybe they played games with them or something, I, I don't know. Um, so when you have a geology map and you find a location with fossils, you've had your GPS, and this is what we did with, with Ronald and his family. We went out there to check the location out exactly that it's in this kind of Russ formation uh, deposit, kind of early uh, Eocene, and then, yep, there we are again. So it's very in interesting and important because no one has ever found a shark tooth uh, uh, before, so we're still studying these fossils. We got some really nice uh, gastropod fossils. We got these uh, nomalites and things, and... Um, so that was that was really cool. So what to do if you find fossils? Um, you know, you need permission to actually work or c collect in a particular area. And it's, but the best thing to do is just to photograph, take a GPS, uh, report it to the um, authorities. And this is what uh, Ronald and his family did. And then we went out there, and then we credit them in the record. It goes in the Abu Dhabi Historic Environment record as found by Ronald Corneef and Ralitza. And then we put the photographs in the record, so it's connected. So you're helping the museum, you're helping the heritage of Abu Dhabi. So, we're going to continue our journey now. We started under the sea in the late Cretaceous. We were still under the sea in Eocene. But we're going to move to uh, more my expert area, which is working in Al Dafra, the western region of Abu Dhabi. And there's been a long history of research that started in the 1980s. Actually, American oil engineers in the 1970s first reported on some fossils, and Peter Wybrow from the Natural History Museum, who I used to be in touch with, Andrew Hill, uh, both Peter Wybrow and Andrew Hill sadly uh, passed away now, but I, I worked with both of them. Um, I first came to Abu Dhabi 30 years ago, um, it's hard to believe, 1994, so I've been working here um, 30 years, and uh, um, and I've been involved with fossils basically since 1996, onwards. And people said, it's just empty desert, isn't it, in the western region? Um, and people, you know, when you go out in the desert, you find everything, you know, fauna, flora, fossils, archaeology, you just n need to know what to look for. And all these dots are different fossil sites. And the number of fossils collected is on this graph at the bottom showing colors. And so we have um, a very rich site at Shui Hat. But we find fossils spread over a very big area from near to Abu Dhabi, near to um, ICAD, Musafa, the Al Dafra military base, all the way as far west as the Sabkamati. So this is the 
Baraka nuclear power station is here. So it's a huge area and all these hills and things, um, you can find fossils. Um, Thomas showed some of the stratigraphy near to Abu Dhabi, showing the um, Aeolian deposits. And then what we have here with the Shwehat formation is more Aeolian uh, type deposits, but the Bainuna formation is a rich river deposit. You have river gravels and uh, pockets of, of clay and different sediments in it. This is a section um, through, that, through that. So you have many different layers. So there's many environmental changes even, even during um, uh, this time. So you can see here Shwehat formation and you have the sort of sand dunes in this bottom part of the sequence and you can see in the photograph here. But then you have layers with uh, mudstone, sandstone, conglomerates, uh, river gravels. So what does it look like today? It looks like this top slide. What it originally looked like is the bottom slide. Um, this is us collecting actually at um, uh, Hamra. You can just about see some little yellow flags. When we find a rich fossil site, the team divides out and we use flags and flag all the fossils that we find. We spread out and then at the end, after a few hours, we then review everyone's flags and we criticize each other. Why did you put the flag in this? This is a rubbish specimen, you know. Um, but what we actually have at Abu Dhabi around seven million years ago is a giant river system. So it looks rather like East Africa today. And in this river, you have crocodiles, you have uh, hippopotamus, um, you have freshwater fish, um, we have different types of elephants, and uh, I'll just give you an idea of these sites. This is actually Shwehat. Um, Shwehat is, is um, my favorite location because it's one of the richest area for fossils, but it's um, some of the area is not accessible to the public now because uh, um, there were some um, issues there. Um, Thomas mentioned about the Gulf being an ancient river basin. You saw that how it was dry at some point, and this shows you why we find these fossil sites. These are these ancient rivers that flowed down into the Gulf uh, basin. So to summarize um, these um, um, sites from seven million years ago, we find them especially in coastal rocks, but we find them some going to the interior. It's a very big area, 200 kilometers from east to west up to uh, 50 kilometers inland. They, the, they date to about seven, seven and a half million years ago. We have some similarities with African uh, savanna type animals, but also some connections to Asia and Europe. So what kind of fossils do we find? We find amazing things. These are some of the things that are going to go on display in the museum. We have fossil wood and different things, and I'm going to show you some of the next fossils. This is a piece of fossil wood, so this is a seven million year old tree. Um, this one is from Bidal Matawa. So if we start off with that one. We also, I mentioned the rivers had crocodiles in them. This is a crocodile scoot. This is a piece of the armor plating. These are g all genuine fossils, by the way. So don't drop them, don't steal them. We're going to turn you upside down, shake your pockets when you leave the room. And then one more fossil here. Can anyone guess what this fossil is? Anyone have an idea? Can you see what this one is? No? Any ideas? Oh, come on. I'm sure you use emojis, some of you. It looks, looks just like the emoji. It's poo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fossil, fossil poo. We find fossil poo from carnivores and also from... Uh, carnivores and also from crocodiles. We have a lot of crocodiles in the river. So you can say, you can go, when you go home tonight, you can say, I held some seven million year old poo in my hand. Yeah. So as paleontologists, we like teeth and jaws because they're very diagnostic to species. And then we, this helps us 
to tell about some of the animals. This is a bit of a crocodile skull, but we have different types of antelopes, different types of, of gazelle, bigger ones, smaller ones. We have at least um, three types of elephants, but the most of them are the four tusked elephants. We have saber-toothed cats, hyenas. We have two types of monkeys. So it shows that there was quite a lot of trees, you know. Um, we have giraffes, you know. You have giraffes on Sabanias Island, but these, of course, are um, uh, modern African giraffes. But we have a giraffe. Do you see the Miocene giraffes have a short neck? So, and then these are some of the bones that we, we have from uh, giraffes. We have fish. These are fish. So these are fish teeth from different types of freshwater fish. These are cyprinid fish, and we have catfish. So these are fragments of catfish skulls. We have birds, but we have different birds. Some of them are extinct birds. This is uh, Anhinga, is a darter. Darters, you don't find them today in, in Arabian Gulf, in UAE. Originally, you can find those one species of data you can find in Iraq. Um, you can find um, um, in India, further away, but there's Anhinga. You don't find it in the, th in the present day fauna. We have cormorants. This is probably a different uh, um, um, type of cormorant species. So, how do we find these small, tiny bones? You saw that we find elephant bones but we also find these tiny, tiny bones. This is a dirham coin here. And on this dirham coin are teeth of different small mammals. There's actually a squirrel, uh, a gerbil, and a cane rat tooth on here. And we spend hours and hours sieving because we have to sift and pick through the residues. And some of these are really small if you see these scale bars, these scale bars are, are in microns. So these are tiny, tiny teeth. Um, this is what cane rats look like. This is a picture from West Africa. Um, some of these are new to science. We gave them for the first time the name in Abu Dhabi. So this gerbil is called Abu Dhabiya Bainunensis. After the, uh, so we named it first in Abu Dhabi. And there are several species like this that we name for first time here. This fossils, these particular teeth of this gerbil, people have now found it in Pakistan and even in China, but it was first scientifically described here, so it has a bigger distribution than what we thought. So again, this gives you a, a flavor of, of how it looked here if we were here, but we're, we've pressed the button now. We're now seven million years ago. This is what it looked like. And this is actually some uh, of our team. And we were with people from Environment Agency and actually one or two Emirates Natural History Group people many years ago. This is 2001. Um, when we find big fossils, we have to use plaster jackets to... Uh, safely get them out of the ground and then bring them back to the museum. So I can't wait to have the new Natural History Museum because we have the laboratory for prepping and cleaning the fossils. And I still have a lot of stuff in plaster jackets that I haven't uh, been able to process yet. So in terms of people say, well, how do you know it's 7 million years ago? How do you know it's uh, 50 million? Well, I on the earlier sites, we have the geology maps and we have an approximate idea on the dating. On this, for this material, we can use something called magnetic dating, paleomagnetic dating. And our latest work on the Bainuna is that it dates to between about 7 to 7.7 .7 million years ago because there are different points in time, magnetic reversals, as Thomas mentioned. Now... Abu Dhabi is very special because we have not only fossil sites, but we have fossil trackway sites. And this is an amazing site in the western region. We have not just one site, but we have many sites with elephant tracks. 
And this is turned to stone. This is not in sand. This is an amazing site, Malaysia site. Here I am with two of my Emirati colleagues from the Historic Environment Department, uh, Abdul Rahman Al Nuaimi, who's now the head of the World Heritage Site in Al Ain, and Abdullah Al Kabi, who's head of our documentation unit now here. This is a few years ago, so they were. Uh, junior guys at that time, and they were helping me with measuring the elephant tracks. This site is amazing. It tells you of a moment in time, a moment in Abu Dhabi seven million years ago. And do you see there's one track going across from bottom left to top right? And then you have a whole series of tracks that are uh, a group, a herd of elephants. So this is amazing. This is a fossilized moment in time from seven million years ago. This is an aerial photograph. You see the scale, bottom right, that's five meters. So this runs for hundreds of meters. It's a super impressive site. And what it's showing is it's the earliest evidence showing behavior in elephants, but you know, very modern behavior in elephants male, lone males, and then the females and juveniles uh, moving um, across the landscape together. This is Maurizio Anton, who's one of the famous paleo artists who's helping us with the museum. Um, and this is what this common elephant that lived in Abu Dhabi seven million years ago looked like with four tusks. So really astonishing. Now, how can you help us find more elephant trackway sites. You can do it from your desktop, from your mobile phone. If you use Google Earth Pro, and something I discovered just a few months ago, Google updated its imagery for Abu Dhabi. And if you zoom in on areas, this is the Malaysia elephant trackway site. Um, someone has helpfully uh, put it in Google Maps. It's not actually that helpful because you can't enter this area. And it's sad to say at the moment, maybe in future, will be open to public, but this is in a restricted area. It's in the Hubara protected area, and it's also oil field security area because there's an oil pipeline, Ruais Habshan oil pipeline going near here. But something I discovered just a couple of months ago, you try zooming in on the image. So this scale bar here, is 400 meters, and see what happens when I zoom in on here. This scale bar here now is 25 meters. Can you see which direction the elephants are walking in on here? Yeah, so up here. This is actually, sh you can actually see the line of prints. You see these very whitish prints just under the yellow label. This is just sitting at my computer. I can see which direction the elephants are walking from seven million years ago using Google Earth. That's amazing, isn't it? Um, now, we have other sites. This is a site at Bid al Matawa that's another elephant trackway site. Which way are the elephants walking here? Like that way, yeah. You see from here going, so they're not going north. We always used to joke the elephants are always walking north down into the river <laughs> basin, but here they, they're going kind of not quite east-west, sort of southeast-northwest kind of direction. Um, now, I started getting obsessed with this and started looking at all <coughs> other areas nearby, and look, uh, some of them it's difficult to say. You have to ground truth, you have to go out there and check, really, is what I'm seeing real, or is it just an artificial pattern? But can you see on this area here, which, which direction are the elephants walking here on this area? You see on here? So they're pretty much going almost east-west there. You can see a line of prints going across. Yeah. I think I can convince you that these are. I mean, we're we're going to go back and check some of these locations. Um, but it's cool that you can use something like satellite imagery. It wasn't good enough quality before. So we've published various books um, over the over the years. Um, the originally the the 1989-1990s work was published in this book, Fossil Vertebrates in Arabia. Um, then I was involved in an exhibition 
uh, Abu Dhabi eight million years ago. Uh, so we've refined our dating <laughs> now down to about seven, but um, that was a book I did with the late Peter Hellier, and it was an exhibition that was in the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi, and we did some school uh, brochures and leaflets, and it was the first attempt to do education in Arabic language about this incredible fossils in, in Abu Dhabi. More recently, um, um, we've published these two books. I've got copies of them here. You can come and have a look at them um, at the end. Um, and if you email me, I can share uh, links for accessing some of these. I just want to thank all the different people that helped, especially the late Miocene work. It's a team. It's, I'm just me talking today, but it's always a team of people. And I hope when you come to the Natural History Museum, you will learn and appreciate even more about the fossils in Abu Dhabi. This is a, 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 a still a conceptual render, but it gives you an idea about the story of Abu Dhabi seven million years ago. And the gallery has part of the river in the floor of the gallery, you have life-size reconstructions of some of the animals and then some of the fossils. So, welcome to the Natural History Museum, uh, December 2025, end of next year. And I uh, hope you enjoyed seeing the fossils that are here. I hope they're all coming back to uh, Hamed. And uh, thank you very much. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. Um, if we can have some help to move the chairs, I can't see. I think the team is coming, or the team is not coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm sure you have a lot of questions. We're going to sit in the seats, and we will take the first question. Thomas, Mark, thank you. Who is first? All right, here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, earlier you mentioned that like there was no device to check underground for like any fossils. Like, is there any science to check for like fossils underground? Um, this is for you, yes. Yeah, the, the best sign, as I showed you on my slide, eyes, brain, legs. You walk around, you, the, how you find fossils is the small pieces on the surface, and especially on the sides of these hills where a good fossil specimen drops out, some fragments break off. You have sun and wind and erosion. And so when you're lucky... You find a few fragments, the whitish fragments, and then, the, then you f go up the slope and you find that it's dropped out of a bigger specimen that's still there, and then you can dig it out. And if it's worth to keep, then you maybe make a plaster jacket to bring it safely back to the museum to clean and prepare. But the best thing is, is just you're using your eyes and of course your geology knowledge and Thomas takes his students he can maybe answer as well about Do you want to how anything? to find fossils well, it's difficult to give uh, um, really good advice it's a lot of experience and uh, you just should uh, get started all right <laughs> thank you another question all right over there Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very informative. Uh, my name is Iman Danish Khan, and I'm 13 years old. And I want to ask you, um, you mentioned all of these animals that were alive 7 million years ago. Uh, what have they evolved into other species, and can they be reintroduced over here? Um, okay. <laughs> They're all extinct um, um, species, but there are some of the relatives of them kind of survive today. You don't get cane rats in Arabia, but you get them in West Africa. You saw the photograph of the guy with one on his shoulder. It's kind of bush meat 
in West Africa. I wouldn't really want to reintroduce uh, those, those here. But um, the, the different elephant species we find, the Stegotetrabelodon with four tusks, just became um, extinct. There's lots of different types of elephants through this time period. We have dinotheas as well that have just downward pointing uh, tusks. They become I I extinct um, after sort of four or three million years ago, and then you have later things, and of course you have mammoths, and of course mammoths um, um, uh, extinct as well, although you can see one if you go to Marina Mall in Abu Dhabi um, on the first, first floor up upstairs. <laughs> But uh, that's from Russia, that one. But um, no, they, they all become um, extinct, but we have relatives like the gerbil that we find. Um, the teeth are completely different to um, modern cheeseman's gerbils that you find in the desert here today. But everything is kind of connected, but it's a very, very distant um, kind of uh, relative. And I guess about reintroduction of some type of elephant or some type of crocodiles or... Well, people talk easier. about resurrecting mammoths and things and taking, you know, DNA out of, you know, Siberian permafrost specimens and things, but it's, it comes down to um, um, ethics as well, um, a bit about what is suitable to do. We have so many interesting scientific questions and questions about, as Thomas mentioned, about dating and understanding processes and sea level change and lots of... We've got many more interesting things to do than trying to bring things back. This is a bit Steven Spielberg, you know, kind of... Uh <laughs> do you want to add anything? Well, I mean, it's uh, obviously... Uh, um, exciting to think about uh, uh, these aspects. But as Mark mentioned, in fact, there are a lot more important things to take care of. Than, um, I mean, paleontology has changed because uh, even among modern organisms, old-fashioned paleontologists uh, used to look um, at the morphology. So, okay, this guy has five ribs, this one has six ribs, so it must be a different species. Nowadays, um, um, it's mostly done uh, using DNA studies uh, because very obviously uh, the morphology, what something looks like, is not necessarily equivalent to whether it's related to uh, uh, something else. You may remember these huge uh, bivalves I've shown which are living on uh, uh, reef flats. Their taxonomy has been more or less uprooted recently by looking into their DNAs and not just counting the ribs and flanges. Thanks. I mean, the other thing is we can't get DNA out of our seven million year old fossils, but we can do lots of other things using new technology. Um, and we had a meeting this afternoon in Louvre Abu Dhabi looking in their laboratory and their equipment and stuff. And we can use things like, you know, just radiography, CT scans. There's a um, new technique um, using synchrotron. Um, we don't have synchrotron here. Though these are very big facilities. You have to go to France, to uh, Stanford in the U.S. and things. And there's a lot of technology we can use to scan fossils and understand how they grow and understand morphology of them, understand, you know, evolutionary processes but by studying internal structures of things and this is the one of the new exciting fields really it's using technology for um, scanning and understanding internal structures because the classic way as Thomas said is comparing morphology and some of my colleagues like our zoology colleagues at the Natural History Museum you know, who were interested in doing DNA, proteomics, this is the future for sort of zoology, natural history, but using fossils, the future is really using different new um, scanning technology, different microprobes, maybe using AI technology, different things like this to investigate these structures. And we're understanding more about dinosaur bones and dinosaur blood and how they work from some of these scanning uh, techniques. So we don't uh, expect to build 
a T-Rex from extracting ancient DNA. It just doesn't work. You know. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question on this side, over there. Hi, uh, so my question was regarding the wood fossil and the poop fossil that you passed around. So I know that uh, fossils containing calcium or non-organic, inorganic matter and how they're made, but how does a, something like wood or poo, which is so decayable and has completely organic matter, stay as a fossil? It depends on the burial conditions and what event, you know, when sometimes you have, it really depends on the substrate, the, if it's like a mud um, um, flow, if it's a sudden uh, deluge that, that submerges things, it depends very much on the particular environment. This is where we go to the geologists and sedimentologists to, you heard about Thomas when he was describing, talking about the 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 sediments and if it's slowly accumulating or a rapid sudden change and stuff so you use the sediments and the rocks to read the environmental story of the context of how they're deposited and sure things some things don't survive some things do survive well it depends purely on the deposit but Abu Dhabi is the western region has this amazing combination of having the best exposures of late Miocene fossils and animal trackway sites of anywhere in the Arabian Peninsula. So Abu Dhabi is very blessed. We think we're blessed with pearls and then blessed with oil and then uh, blessed with lots of things today. But actually, you know, it, it's a, um, a special place as well geologically. It's in this very interesting crossroads and you saw that the fossil animals I showed, some connect to Africa, some connect to Asia. Um, so it shows this land bridge. We're in a very strategic kind of position here. So it's very interesting geologically and zoologically as well. Yeah. And actually I was just thinking about the fossil dunes how long to get that entire dune fossilized like this? It must have been a very rapid... It can happen very uh, uh, quickly because um, carbonates are very reactive. Uh, so uh, the cementation can indeed um, happen very rapidly. So and we're talking about what, months, days? Well, um, a year or two. So one seasonal cycle uh, basically could be uh, could be enough. But then fossils can be preserved in really a large range of um, of ways. You know the um, insects being caught in amber. Then you can simply have imprints in a very fine sediment. The more, the finer the sediment, the more details will be uh, preserved. If you have a conglomerate, large pebbles, there is no chance for any fossils uh, uh, to be preserved. And um, there are many different ways how um, the most outrageous things, like <laughs> some of those we have seen, um, mm. can be fossilized. Mm. Depends on the climate as well, the season. One of the things about Abu Dhabi seven million years ago is that you have quite a long dry season, but you have a wet season. So it's very much like being in East Africa. You know, you have a season when it rains a lot, the, the rivers burst their sort of banks. We have this amazing elephant trackway sites preserved in many, many places, as, as you see. So they're walking along the edges, the sort of muddy sides of the river uh, channels. And then it's the end of the, you know, the, there's the wet season, the dry season, it dries out, the prints dry out. You have another wet season and sediment kind of floods over it. So it kind of uh, traps it. It's like, you know, it's, it's like if you go to the beach and seaside and you your footprints stay in the wet sand near the sea but then if too much water comes in they wash and your footprints disappear but if the sediment is quite you know and as thomas said you know you it can it 
you know, in, in high salinity, high temperature, low uh, action things, things can harden and, and can preserve, and then you have further sediment washes on top. So it's, it's just fortuitous. It depends on the erosion regime. Mm. Thank you. Another question? Just here? Thank you for presenting. I'm sorry I missed your uh, presentation, but uh, I have a question about uh, the theory of the Eye of the Sahara. Uh, about 2019, I met a Chinese professor from the University of Oklahoma who pinpointed the theory that we have uh, reduced uh, rain in Abu Dhabi is due to the Sahara. And he pinpointed that uh, the Sahara used to be a big lake and that lake would uh, obviously evaporate and then the water and rain would uh, rain in Abu Dhabi. Uh, recently a documentary came out uh, from the World Food uh, Program that they are replanting and reintroducing water in the Sahara, which would be north of uh, Senegal and Mauritania. Do you think uh, more species would come back? Would we get more rain from the eye of the Sahara? Well, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> each of you who has a garden or has walked through a park in this climate, if you just uh, add water, everything is uh, flourishing. And uh, this, of course, um, attracts all types of uh, birds, other animals. So a lot of uh, the animals now living in Abu Dhabi wouldn't be here if uh, there wouldn't be all the garden and uh, the parks, which provide an ecosystem uh, for them. So, in fact, if uh, uh, desert areas uh, um, could be given the water that is uh, needed, then uh, obviously you could turn them into very different ecosystems. It's uh, just about the economies of uh, making the water available while <coughs> an increasing proportion of human beings are suffering from the non-availability of uh, clean water. So, that's part of the ethical problem that you probably also refer to. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, thank you for your explanation. Very interesting. Uh, my question would be, uh, currently the UAE invested in uh, almost 4 billion uh, onshore seismic uh, scans. And we kind of have a great understanding of what's uh, below the ground. Obviously seismic, you won't see anything. Uh, and the 4D seismic uh, is not... Uh, at its level to really go deeper and understand. Uh, but as a young aspiring paleontologist, I'm not a paleontologist, but for the young kids in the audience, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think their future would be? It's already, we know everything now, I'm sure. So. No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. The future, future is bright. Um, I think the Natural History Museum will stimulate a lot of uh, young Emiratis and visitors and other residents of UAE to appreciate the environment, our world, to want to protect it, to want to research it more. We have a lot of research questions still remain unsolved. We don't know everything. We don't have good idea on dating a lot of our deposits. We are still discovering new species in the fossil deposits in Abu Dhabi, and th this will, you know, will continue. It slowed down a bit because we worked intensively for more than 20 years, and we published these two two books. Um, um, so we've drawn a bit of a line, but we're still um, we're doing more research on the um, trackway sites um, for people interested in um, drone technology using AI. Um, um, using um, um, prospecting uh, techniques in the desert, some of these things will Im improve. We, we'll find more sites in the future. This will be legacy for uh, you to continue research in the future. So I would encourage you to continue in uh, paleontology, to um, um, read, to study, to visit as many uh, places as you can, to maybe go to Khalifa University to geosciences department, yeah. 
I guess, yes, Thomas, you, 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 yeah, you want more students working with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, um, <clears throat> um, the public perception is uh, shifting. As long as I'm a geologist, there always have been ups and downs. Now, of course, with uh, COP28 and uh, climate change being more in the public discussion, then, of course, there are also more students interested in these uh, topics. All right. Thank you. All right. We have a question here. Okay. You got everything back. <laughs> They're all back? Okay. The question is uh, for Thomas. Um, just a, a brief visitor here. And the other day we went to, uh, I believe it's Sal Shua, the hidden oasis. And the walk up to it was through this incredible boulder field. Um, it, it looked like a very violent event must have occurred. And, and uh, it's away from the recent the geologic mechanisms you're talking about, but it must be evidence of, of some other things going on here, uh, at least in those mountains. So where it's exactly did you, did you go? I'll put my tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Ras al Khaima, the hidden oasis up Jebel Jace. Uh, it's You see it a lot on social media, but it's climbing up. Um, you kind of start where the Bear, Bear Grylls camp is, up the wadi that goes up Jebel Jace. Um, and part of the trail is just through this massive boulder field. Yeah. Well, there is a lot of... Um, <coughs> gravity-related uh, erosion happening. There are many uh, uh, landslides, rock slides, which uh, occurred just a relatively short time ago. And there, are in fact, are many sites where you can see such uh, uh, quite impressive, obviously uh, very violent um, events that uh, happened. It's just a topography. It's a relatively young topography. You have steep slopes. Uh, sometimes the bedding is parallel to the slope, and then uh, rock slides can um, can happen any time, particularly when, uh, when there was a strong rainfall. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question. Let you let had one? Okay. Run okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the guy who found the shark yeah. tooth. It's, it's sorry. a guy. <laughs> sorry. He's, yeah. There you go. got to be nice. To <laughs> so so my, my question is for uh, Dr. Schroeder. Um, in one of the first slides you showed, you see the, the sea level, and it, it looks very cyclic. It goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Does that mean that no matter what we do, it's going to keep rising? And... The only thing we do makes it faster or slower? Well, under, let's say, normal circumstances, we, wouldin, we would be heading towards the next ice age, which most likely would occur only within uh, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. Uh, I think currently we are just getting engaged in um, a large experiment to artificially extend the warm time period between the ice ages that we are currently enjoying to live in. So um, climate change is very much about uh, the time scales involved. What is about to change is not extraordinary. Much more significant events happened during Earth's history. What's uh, just uh, unique and therefore uh, uh, quite harmful for us is the rate of change. So we're just speeding things up. Exactly. Yeah. We are speeding things up to um, um, a level where it's very difficult for humans to uh, react appropriately, to adapt. Thank you. All right. Okay. I just had one more question here. Okay, last one. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about um, lions in the Arabian area. So in our culture and in our poems, uh, we always speak about lions and in our language, we have more than 70 names for the lion. But I've never seen lions and I've never heard about any remains or fossils. 
But you said that... Um, we have saber-toothed cats, yeah, and they were pretty big and scary looking. Thankfully, we were not around here at that uh, time. Yeah. Um, but, um, like, I'm talking about 1,500 years ago. So there were poems about uh, around that area and uh, about that time. And that's just basically about uh, fighting lions, killing them, and being brave. So 1,500 years ago, was there any lions? Um, there are in the archaeological record. There are, um, ag again, we have different types of, of cats. You know, you have, of course, you know, Arabian leopard. You have uh, caracals. Uh, cats. You have wild uh, sand cats in the uh, desert. I think in Saudi Arabia, where you're nearer to Africa, and Yemen, where you're nearer to, you know, I think there there are some fossil uh, cat um, um, records. We don't, as I said, we have a very particular saber-tooth cat that we find in Abu Dhabi and you saw one of the slides I showed um, and there was we have some leg bones and uh, uh, of it but it had you know it, it, it's the li like the later ice age uh, saber-tooth cat but this is a different um, um, one it's uh, homotherium it's a Miocene genus of, of cat but it was pretty scary looking, more scary than the lions actually, because it's just this massive canine tooth makes them look really, um, really scary. So, yeah, you need to press the time transporter, go back seven million years ago, and then they'd be hiding under a tree waiting to pounce on one of the giraffes or uh, uh, gazelles that were here. Well, it's good we'll see them at the museum, not uh, the live ones. <laughs> yeah, you'll see a reconstruction of a saber-toothed cat in the museum. I showed you that r render showing what the gallery will look like because we only have fragments of bones from them, so we decided to make um, a life-size model of, of, of one, and it's actually chasing an, an antelope, so it's in a sort of action pose. So you'll, you'll get to see that, and you'll see the actual cat fossils in the museum next next to the scale model so yeah. yeah that's great thank you we can't wait to go to that museum all right well thank you again thomas mark this was really 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 interesting um and i thank you everyone for coming it was a nice crowd tonight um next Science Talk is actually in two weeks. We're doing it just before Ramadan, and we're going to talk about any, another very, very interesting topic, plankton. Okay, so see you in two weeks. Have a good evening. <laughs>